So tonight, um, it feels like old home week. Um, I get to introduce two, two dear old friends, uh, Sarah Herr, Lisa Young, who are going to be discussing when is a village. And so I will turn it to them, take it away. Okay. Thanks, Doug. Um, I wanna say thank you also to Archaeology Southwest for inviting me here. It was really nice to leave home in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where it was 15 <laughs> degrees when I flew out, and that was the warmest it had been in two weeks. <laughs> Um, Sarah and I tonight are going to introduce ourselves, talk about how we got interested in this issue of uh, villages in general and communities also. And then um, we actually are going to ask you to do some work um, and brainstorm about what is a village in your perspective and then we're going to use your input to uh, then tar start talking about villages in the southwest. So as Doug said, I'm Lisa Young. Um, I uh, got my PhD from the University of Arizona. I now teach at University of Michigan and um, I'm on a tenure track there. So that means I also have a research affiliation at the Arizona State Museum, which I'm very proud of. Um, and I work in the Hamalvi area of Northeastern Arizona. Uh, how many people have been to the Hamalvi area? Yes. So you know all about scenic Winslow and um, most of you probably know about the ancestral Pueblo sites that are there, and um, I work on the earlier things. So um, a pit house village and a very, the first Pueblo that's there, um, we'll be focusing more on the earlier end of things with the, the pit house villages tonight. Um, and I'm Sarah Herr, and I'm with um, Desert Archaeology here in Tucson, and I've been trying not to um, tell Tucson, um, Lisa how nice it is every time I interact <laughs> with her. Um, <laughs> and um, I've worked um, most of my career along the Muggio and Rim, either north or just south of it, and um, um, became interested in this time period um, when Lisa um, had a field school at Hamalavi in uh, 1997, and I became her TA for a year. And then um, I've had the experience of working at other early sites um, since then as part of um, various highway alignment projects along the Maguillon Rim. Um, so, um, yeah. So what happened is that a few years ago, Sarah and I started talking about these pit house villages that we were both working on, and um, I said to Sarah, you know, it'd be really nice to do um, a Society for American Archaeology symposium where we could look at this early time period from 900, or uh, sorry, from 200 to 900 AD across the entire Southwest because we all knew very interesting things were happening during that time period, but we hadn't had a conversation across the different areas. And so I twisted Sarah's arm and uh, we decided we didn't want it just to be culture history, we wanted a theme. And so the theme we picked was communities, to think about what these early groups of people were doing as they were making this transition to farming and settling down, how were they creating communities? And that sort of led us to also thinking about villages. Um, the Southwest is such an amazing place to work on villages because um, it, 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 historically we have some of the longest occupied villages in the United States. Aribi says that it's been, it's been inhabited for almost a thousand years if not longer. And so we have this very long time span of villages. The other thing that's interesting about villages is they're all over the world. And so this is something, these are um, processes that we can think about not only here in the Southwest, but in other places in the world. And I actually grew up in a village, <laughs> and I didn't realize that the suburbs of Chicago, almost all the suburbs are called villages <laughs> instead of towns or cities. Um, and in fact, my mom just recently moved to uh, a small, what I would call a village near me, and they just voted to go from being a village to a city. <laughs> and so it's interesting to think about the villages that we have now and then, uh, that we, all, we live in now, and then villages in the past. So because I teach large lecture classes, I'm constantly thinking about how to engage people in, in what I'm teaching about. So I'm going to give you a minute at your table, <laughs> and I want you to talk to your neighbors about the first three words that come into your head when you hear the word village. <laughs> 
And I don't want you to say to me Hillary Clinton, because we already know <laughs> about her book. And, but I want you to think about maybe what the essence of that is. Or, you know, Sarah and I were looking up famous quotes, and Gandhi has a quote about villages being the heart and soul of India. So when you think about village, what are the first three words that come into your head? We're going to write them here, and then we're going to use that to talk. So take that minute, really quick, brainstorm about those three words, or more, and we'll come back. <laughs> so time's up. <laughs> so who would like to share something that came to mind when they were thinking about villages? Go ahead. Critical mass. Critical. What is the definition of a village? Is there a set per population number or constitution of the population which defines a village? Excellent. So, population. Great. Thank you very much. Good. We're, you hit it on the head. That's one of the things we're going to talk about. What else did you think of when you thought of villages? Center. Go ahead. Community. Community. Great. Center. Center. Like a place where people come to? And what do you think of when they're, they're coming to that center? Like a place where people come together, uh -huh. meet and exchange, or play checkers, watch the kids play. Great. So it has a shared space yeah, shared at space. it. Great. Perfect. Jointly used resources. I'm sorry, what? Jointly used resources. Right. And then they're shared together. Excellent. What else? <laughs> That's a great. <laughs> That's wonderful. But it's sort of autonomous and together and yeah, great. What else? Go ahead. Structure. Structure. How do you mean structure? Because the Pueblo, the first signs of like room divisions and actual like establishments of space. And, and so there's some organization yeah. to that that space yeah. there. Excellent. Good. Go ahead. Right, and so the people that live there are organized in some way too. So yeah, kinship and and close kinship, sort of. I saw your hand. Neighbors helping neighbors, or it's a helping society. Going with that community idea too, helpful things. Go ahead. Sustainable. Oh, that would be lovely. <laughs> and isn't that interesting with the Southwest that to think about sustainability. And like I, I mentioned, many of the Pueblo groups have been living in the same place for probably close to a millennium, so they clearly are sustainable on, on that level. What about economy? What do you think of when you think of a village? The artisans, like it's a place where the artisans are. So maybe some people have some specialized tasks, maybe, yeah? <laughs> yeah, and often they're watching what your business is. So yeah, everybody, everybody's closely related to other other people. I knows what people are doing. Yeah. Um, early signs of markets where people would come meet at one place to trade. So it, we're getting into sort of more complicated villages, um, and I asked you to think about today, but uh, yeah. Um, so when Sia and I have been thinking about um, these sorts of things, we've been thinking about the earliest farming villages. So farming is there, um, is, is an important aspect of those, those villages too. All righty. Is that a good list for us to start from? <laughs> Some other things than we were thinking about. All righty, good. Um, so we have villages that are part of our contemporary world today um, and important institutions still today. But the, the theme of this talk is when. Um, and villages are so interesting because they seem to form the building block for more complicated things like artisans and markets and a more complicated uh, societies in general. But the question is, when do they start? And one of the things that archaeologists recognize is that the transition to villages is a very large change that happens in human societies. In the Southwest, before uh, we were having villages, we were, we had, people were hunter-gatherers. They were making the transition to farming. But when we get those villages, something different is starting to happen. 
And so Sarah is going to now talk a, a little bit about some case studies that she's worked on. I'll interject a little bit from the area where I've worked. And then we wanted to just bring out some general themes that we spent the last two weeks having a lovely time talking about as we were preparing for this talk. Um, and I have to tell you, we don't have any answers, but um, I'm hoping it, it sends you home with things to think about um, and a little bit of background in the archaeology, especially of the northern southwest, although we may end with talking a little bit about the, the, um, the Tucson Basin a little bit too. So, okay. Okay. Um, so one thing we wanted to um, um, be clear about as we started talking about villages is to differentiate them a little bit from um, settlements because one thing that we're looking at is that transition to a village and um, somehow you sort of feel like once you're in a village you kind of know it but before you're in the village there's this sort of amorphous um, organization going on and so um, our neutral word for that is a settlement and we're saying that um, a settlement equals the sum of its parts so if you have 30 houses and one of those houses one of those households walks away the settlement isn't really compromised um, by that. Um, people kind of keep on doing what they're doing. When you have a village, there's enough, um, the, the village is greater than the sum of its parts. There's enough complementarity of um, relationships within that village. Um, you know, maybe there's um, relationships in um, hunting organizations or religious organizations or um, food sharing organizations. So when one household leaves, then you feel that loss a little bit. So that's how we kind of conceptually differentiate. And you don't know quite where this thing clicks over, but um, as we're talking about um, the various sites in this time period, not all of them are um, villages. It hasn't quite happened yet, but there can be some fairly large aggregations of people. So the case study that, we, um, that we're both really most familiar with um, is, is the Southern Colorado Plateau, um, this area that's along the um, middle Little Colorado River. Um, we're going to probably talk mostly about the, well, we are going to talk about the Arizona side of um, things, so sort of from uh, what, uh, Zuni towards the west. And there's a fair number of sites that have been excavated between this um, 200 and 900 um, time period. Um, but not quite enough for us to feel like we have a lot of solid um, information, like little parts of sites. There's been a lot of highway projects that have excavated, you know, one house out of 30. But in this, um, so I think there's um, maybe about 15 sites in this time period that have been excavated with enough published to, to make it a useful um, resource. Um, the the um, um, so some of the earliest sites um, include those in the, the uh, well, I should say that in this area, one of the um, focal points is the Petrified Forest. There's the, the Himalavi is on the, on the west. The Petrified Forest is kind of on the east side. So if you've been to the Petrified Forest, you know some of the landscapes in Winslow um, area. And um, so some of the nicest sites are in this Petrified Forest area. And there's um, dating about to between about like 200 and 500. Um, most of the sites are small. They're um, maybe two houses, maybe five houses. That's sort of the standard pattern across the landscape. Um, but every so often there's a really a fairly substantial um, site. So some of you might have heard of the site of Flat Top. There's a site called Savuavi in the Petrified Forest. Um, and there's a site na um, near Snowflake that's called the Connie site. And these sites are kind of exceptions to this. There are these big aggregations of pit houses. There might be, you know, 20 to 40 pit houses at these sites. And the houses, um, though, so there's a lot of them, but the houses also look very fragile. They're, um, you know, very shallow. Um, they don't look like they have big, massive roofs. Um, so big aggregations of very fragile houses is what, like, are the, um, is one s signature of this time period. Some of these sites even have communal structures. Some of the earliest um, communal structures um, in the southwest, maybe they're like 10 meters in diameter. They're not huge, huge or 10 yards or meters in diameter. Um, they're not huge, huge things, but they have these community spaces spaces in them. Um, um, and um, so it's not at every site has a community space. They're sort of, they're there, but they're, they're rare. Um, in the second part of this period, between about 500 and 900, we probably see fewer of these large sites. Um, we see still the, you know, five room, um, you know, or five house clusters. And um, there might be a bunch of those clusters all in a single area, or they might just be sort of dispersed across it. And then the houses get a lot um, more labor intensive. Like they, they start looking like people are sticking around more. There might be different kinds of structures. So there's residential structures where people are living. And then there might be different kinds of structures that don't have the signs of habitation so much. Like, like they don't have the, um, the hearth or the fire pit in the middle of the structure. It might just be a deep 
hole, basically, that we assume that people are using for storage or maybe some special activities. And then some of these sites, again, have community structures and some of them don't. And so um, hopefully this gives you a little bit of a sense of um, some of the problems that we have, are starting to have in terms of understanding um, the sort of um, run up to when you um, start getting villages is that the size of the site, you know, just walking over it on the surface, 30 houses, you think maybe that has the critical mass to be a, a village, but, um, but not necessarily. Um, and that's the earlier, and then it kind of drops away. So there's not a unilineal like progression where you have the five houses, then ten houses, then thirty houses, and then it all kind of clicks, and there's a communal structure, and and um, and there you have your your village. Um, so there's a lot of um, variation and complexity, and so that's just to kind of give you a sense of what the archaeology um, looks like there. Um, what. What do we want to do with that? <laughs> so, um, so what you've seen, uh, what Sarah's been talking about is that, um, that, that you know, what do you do when you have five, uh, at the average site is five houses. I mean, your question about how big is a village, um, to me, that's a bunch of people who are related living with each other and are living next to each other. And so we um, often call that a hamlet. Um, and, and it's not a village yet. And so, you know, that, this question of when, when do we get villages? And you, all of your questions, your, many of you are talking about things where people know each other's business, where everybody knows each other. But if you think about it in a village, you're living with people that you're not directly related to. I grew up in this village that was the suburbs of Chicago. There were 14,000 of us, and I knew a lot of people there, but I didn't know everybody there. But that village was structured around, uh, we used to call it uptown, where the railroad tracks were to go to the city. And you know there, there was an organization to it, and we could see the space. So as archaeologists, when do we start to see that transition? The Southwest is so interesting, too, because um, corn is introduced about 2000 BC, plus or minus. There are people in this crowd who could tell me differently. <laughs> um, but we don't see the transition to substantial houses and people living in those larger communities, which we would see as villages for more than 2,500 years after corn is first being grown in the Southwest. So, uh, you know, when you think about farming and farming villages, there's a disjuncture here. So what's going on? Um, one of the things that we have to think about as we excavate is how can we see when people are settling down? And that's another critical thing about villages that I asked you to think about contemporary villages, but um, when I think of a village, people are staying there year-round. Um, they're living in that place. And so when Sarah and I worked in the pit house village at Hamalavi, um, I was grappling with this question of here I have a pit house village that I called it archaeologically, but was it behaviorally? Was it a... a were people living in what we think of as a village today? And one of the issues with these sites that are, um, you know, I'm saying are very um, large is that we, we don't actually know how many of those um, houses are being occupied at the exact same time. Right. So the question is, um, you know, are they, um, are all those 30 houses at this big site, are, they, are um, four of them occupied at the same time or all 30? Um, so um, that's part of looking for the settle down thing is, is, um, is, getting a sense of seasonality, because it might be that, that your site um, is actually kind of really spread out. You have an a winter aggregation, you have very summer spots, and that's part of the problem that's being worked out. Right, right. I, um, uh, one of our friends, Kathy Cameron, did estimates of if you're living in a pit house. Does everybody know what a pit house is? Okay, great. <laughs> so you know in a pit house, you know, I'm coming from Michigan where people are like, what are you talking about <laughs> pit house-wise? Um, with a uh, pit house, the wood is in the ground. It's put in the ground to make the roof. And um, so the, the wood decays actually fairly rapidly because it's in the ground. In fact, at, at the site in Winslow where I work, we put in pine stakes one year, and I came two years later and pulled one out of the ground, and the termites had eaten the bottom of it. And when I asked the ranchers what they used for their wooden um, posts, they said, oh, we usually use cedar. And I said, why? And they said, because that lasts longer. The bugs aren't going to get it, uh, eat it as much. 
And so, uh, you know, the estimates of those pit houses that we're excavating, they may only last 15 to 20 years. So when people build a pit house, this is not the house that they're going to pass on to their kids or grandkids. It's, it's, it's a short-term house that they're building to live in for a decade or two. So they, besides we get these sites and we can't figure out how many houses are contemporaneous, the other question is at this transition, as people are starting to do more and more farming, are they staying at that place, at that pit house village, um, all year round. And one of the things that was interesting for me as I started working on these earlier sites in Hamalavi is that people stored their grains in big bell-shaped storage pits instead of above ground, not in rooms. And so the question then was, why, why would you store in a pit? And a pit makes an excellent storage facility because you can close it, you can seal it, 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 if you put it in a place where the water can drain through it and you've sealed it enough so that the mice can't get in it, um, it it's excellent storage. The problem is it's hard to get into because you have to break that storage thing. Uh, the ones that I excavated, uh, you know, when I stood in them, you could barely see my, my, the top of my head. So they were deep, hard to get to, not as easily as going in and out of a room. The other thing about a pit, though, is you can hide it. So if you're taken off for a while, your corn can be stored in that pit and you can leave. Um, or people don't know where it is because you, you've hidden it. So it suggested to me that the sites that have these big storage pits might be places where people are, are living there seasonally. And they're coming back seasonally, but they may not be there all year. So they may take off for certain seasons and go hunt in the mountains. And believe me, at Hamalvi, you'd like to get out of there in June because the water and the <laughs> river gets really stagnant. And you know, just after you've done all your agricultural things, you might want to get out of there. Um, so when I first came to this, this pit house village, that was one of the questions is, are people living there all year round? And, and even though I call it a village archeologically, what does that mean in terms of how people are relating to each other? So it's one of the issues that um, as we make these transition, at least we see the transitions to villages in the northern southwest, even though we've got people building substantial houses, making nice storage pits, they may not be living at that place all year round. They still may be taking off in small groups. And so if we're thinking about the structure of a village where people um, are living together and knowing each other's business and there's a critical mask, it, it, it shows you again the sort of complexities and this long transition that we see, especially in the northern southwest, to people getting to uh, uh, a type of archaeological site and a type of organization that we would call a village. So what are some other topics that we want um, to talk we were, about? Well, we were going to talk about the community structures because we see the community structures at both the um, sites that may be um, inhabited by people living there seasonally and at the sites um, that um, may be um, used year-round. Um, so um, one of the things that we wanted to um, sort of make a point of when talking about villages is that we can um, break villages down into all these components. Like we can say a village should have a community space, a village should have people living there year-round, a village probably has farmers living in it, um, a village has a, maybe a certain population size, but no one of these variables is the critical variable. Like you can't just say, I have a communal structure, uh, therefore I have a village. And so the community structure play into um, creating these these central spaces um, at this time but they're not um, but they're there at sites that are not villages as well and um, did you want to talk more about communal structures or um, so one of the, one of the things we've been thinking about as archaeologists is when do you put the effort into building a community structure when if you're, if, if the gatherings that are bringing people together are things like weddings and funerals and naming ceremonies and things like that, those happen sporadically. It's when a family has that event and you don't necessarily need to build a big huge structure for that. For any of you that have been to the, any of the Apache puberty rite ceremonies, you know that temporary structures go up and the ceremonies happen in that space. So when we start to see 
groups of people, groups of farmers, households of farmers coming together to build a community structure, what does that mean? And for me as an archaeologist, it makes me think that they are starting to have gatherings and events on a regular basis. That it's not just one family's rite of passage, it's, it's something that's happening regularly. And it's something different that's happening from what's gone before, where you want to create that space where people gather together and have a substantial structure to have those um, ceremonies in. The other thing that it does is it creates a sense of place. Mm -hmm. And that's something that came out in, it, it was sort of implied in some of the things you were talking about, that when we think of villages, we were talking about sedentism, but we were also talking about um, an attachment often to a place and a way of creating an identity with those groups of households that come together, which may be particularly important as you start adding more and more households to your community and you get um, households that are not directly related to each other. And that's where this, this nice kinship came in to think about all these different ways that people can be related and as people start living in bigger, bigger groups, what's the kind of glue that keeps them together? You know, when everybody knows everybody's business, you know people are going to be fighting with each other. And what keeps you together in that group to say, we are this village. We are from this village. And it, it's multiple households that may not be directly related to each other. But what's that glue that keeps and keeps one, people together. And one part of that glue is, is being in this place. So, I mean, if you think about it, as you make the um, move from being, um, you know, sort of in a hunting and foraging life way to um, being a, a very committed farmer, um, you know, there's all sorts of um, places in between that. Um, you're, you're staying in this place more. And then you start having more experiences in this place. So you start having, um, you know, more life events in this place. You start bringing more activities to this place. So, um, for example, in the um, before you're a farmer, you might be, um, you know, you, you go out to your resource, you might be, um, you know, there for um, a month, uh, I don't know, roasting your agave or um, probably not doing that on the Southern Colorado Plateau. <laughs> um, pine nuts. <laughs> yeah, getting your pine nuts. And then you might, you know, in another month be in, at a different place. And so you're spreading your experiences around the landscape. I mean, so you'll have, you know, these various name places and these relationships with the landscape. As you're creating your village, you're starting to bring, maybe you're starting to bring your resources back home and uh, um, to you. And so that becomes more and more of a central place um, for all of your activities. And so it kind of accrues meaning. Um, um, it sort of layers on to this, this central place. And so the community structure is one part of that. This is the place where you've now had your, um, all your rites of passage. It's where you've had your community events. It's where you're now doing, you know, more of your economic um, processing. It's where you're doing more of your crafts. And everything's getting kind of centralized um, here. And, and um, so these, they're, they're it kind of becomes this change in, in meaning and the place becomes a little bit more central and you start to see, um, you know, more depictions of identifying with a place. Um, there will start being, um, li like um, in, in some of the rock art up in the Four Corners area, you'll start seeing people depicting communal spaces and people um, in processions towards those spaces. And so this um, kind of centrality um, comes with, with uh, more and more experiences happening in central places, which I'm not sure I'm explaining very well, but there's a process of placemaking that happens in this, this time period that's a very different from being extensive to being more intensive in a single spot. Um, yeah, somewhere between 500 and 600 AD, we start to see people b building what we call as archaeologists great kivas, but these huge uh, community structures that Sarah was, was mentioning. And it looks like that's also a time when we start to get depictions in the rock art where there's a circle and it looks like there's lines of people coming to that circle. And that's at the time when we start to first feel comfortable as archaeologists calling the sites that we're finding villages in the way Sarah and I have been talking about them. We're not just talking about pit houses and substantial structures. We're talking about what are the human relations behind them, that, that behind those archaeological signatures. So thinking about this more as the people that are living in those spaces and, and what their lives are like. So that, that period starting around 500 AD and, and really not several hundred years before we get sites where people are very comfortable saying, okay, these are, these are now villages. Mm -hmm.
So, so one of the other um, um, critical variables to, um, to villages is the, the very first one that was mentioned, the sort of critical mass and the population size. And there's a, um, there's a big demographic change in the Southwest at about somewhere between 500 and, and 700 um, that's, you know, been recognized by everybody who maps, um, you know, population. And <laughs> as everybody says, you can't really quantify the numbers, but you can quantify the shape of the curve. <laughs> so you can see this big rise. And a lot of things are happening at this time. And this seems, this is probably um, a really key part of, of why villages sort of latch in, is um, there might not be, um, the sites might not get any bigger, but in the region and in the southwest, populations are growing. And um, so some of the things that are happening in this time period is that there's um, new kinds of corn. There's not the popcorn anymore, um, the early tiny little popcorns. There's, there's a flower corn. Um, you start seeing ceramics have been around um, or, uh, you know, kind of usable um, ceramics have been around since maybe about 200 um, in the northern southwest on this part of the plateau. Um, but they're not at every site. And by about 500 or 600, they're starting to be at every site. Um, so um, there may be new ways of cooking um, the foods and that, that might be better for nutrition. There's new kinds of gr um, grinding tools. Um, the matades change. Um, that in ways that um, make processing flour corn more efficient, so you might be getting more nutrition out of your corn, and um, they might be doing um, like things like I think it's debated, but you know bow and arrow technology is is becoming more and more common. So there's all these changes in food that you can see um, might be promoting better nutrition, which might be promoting better people that say are promoting better fertility, and population is rising, but population hasn't yet risen to the point where there's all the disease that comes with a high population. So they see that they, they're, there's a, um, a whole set of writing about this, um, this, this transition. They call it the Neolithic demographic transition where they see this population rise and they see it as a fertility thing before a whole lot of death happens. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's the period, uh, a, re a really pretty big spike um, or, or growth, growth period. And so that, um, that population change probably has something to do with why things might start latching in more after 500 and 600 than they did before. So they had, they had the communal structures, they had the maze, they had all of this stuff before, but, but regionally there's a big, there's a big change in, in demography. The other thing that happens at this time period is things are starting, because there's more people, things are starting to get more dense. And so you can also think about um, kind of changing interactions. Um, in places, and so there's going to be more interactions in a single spot. So, um, so in a community, there's just more people. There's more, um, you know, if you have a, um, I don't know, if you if you have a. Um, what's the word, like, you know, it's sort of a trade relationship. You don't have to go as far. Um, there's just more people. So there's more efficiencies by living in more dense contexts. And so there might be some of these, um, the village might be creating some solutions in terms of, in terms of like, um, social interactions as well. So, so the, um, the, um, the critical mass and the population size seems to be part of the story um, for why, um, for some of the changes in organization in villages. And also, um, there also becomes um, the opportunity for more of these complementarities in terms of um, you might see um, in, in those sites where I said that, you know, if one person or one household goes away, um, it doesn't much matter. There might be start being more, um, um, like, the, the, they call it, like, division of labor in, in the anthropology uh, literature. So there might be more, like, you do this, I do this in a village because I can count on you being there. And so it's not that everybody's doing the same thing in these redundant modular ways. There's more of these interlinkages that start to develop um, with the, these um, greater populations, too. And you see it in the spaces when you see these time, when you see that there's a residential structure that's different than a um, storage structure, that's different than the communal structure, and that's different than maybe this, you know, outdoor kitchen area. There's, like, starting to be this more structured space that suggests that these activities are becoming, um, are, are becoming, um, well, they're, they're all sort of fitting together within the settlement instead of within a single household, basically. So people are kind of spreading their way their activities happen. Um, so. so we haven't answered the question of when is a village. <laughs> <laughs> and we didn't tell you at the beginning that Sarah and I work in the areas that Jeff Dean once called the population trough in the Southwest. So in both our areas, I would say that villages are very late. But in the Mesa Verde area, villages in the Northern Southwest where we're thinking of, should we draw pictures now? <laughs> um, <laughs> so in the Mesa Verde area, Four Corners area, um, several of the archeologists that work up there have argued that villages really get going um, about 750 AD. 
And what's interesting about those villages is they are sequences of pit houses, often with rooms associated with them. Sometimes they form nice arcs around them, and I'm doing a really terrible job drawing this. But what you should know is that this pattern of directionality um, is very, very important on the Northern Plateau. Um, where you have the rooms and then the pit houses and then there's often a trash midden out there. People like to organize their space so that their pit houses are facing towards the east or the southeast. That's in contrast to what's happening here in the Tucson Basin where villages seem to get started a little bit earlier. There's a little debate about when that happens, but for those of you who have seen archaeology... Oh, we, we learned today that that was um, J April of 5.30. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad. <laughs> that was our village. That was, yeah, that's as of 10 a.m. It's fresh off the Okay, presses. good. There you go. You got the latest news. <laughs> But here, what we have is courtyard groups with, I'm gonna do a really crappy job here, but, but houses facing in towards a courtyard group like this. Um, sometimes there's four of them. And then often with these courtyard groups, then there's a big plaza area and there's more cor courtyard groups around them. And about 800 AD, there starts to be a ball court here. We already told you about the great kivas that are here, up here. Sometimes those sites have great kivas. My point in this is to just, it's, it's really interesting to think as villages are forming in different areas of the Southwest, different areas of the world, they are starting their own cultural traditions about how do you organize space so that people interact with each other? How do you pick a community structure? These community structures are dug into the ground. They have roofs on them. So uh, the group is enclosed when they go into those community structures. The ball courts in this area are very large, they're very open, and those plaza areas are open. It suggests a different type of interaction between groups within those village communities um, that might be happening in the different areas of the Southwest. And when you think of villages throughout the world, we think of them as part of the traditional lifeways. But one of the exciting things about being an archeologist and thinking in a comparative perspective is this transition to villages is where those beginnings of those cultural traditions, you can really start to see them in terms of how the communities are organized and how these, these villages are organized. Should we let them ask questions? I think that sounds great. How do we do time-wise? All right. <laughs> okay. So now um, we have questions. Our first so, question is right over here. And we'll see if we have any better answers. A <laughs> uh, question related to villages at different points in time. Are you seeing any sense of hierarchical structures within the definition of any village or not? That's an excellent question and very much debated. Um, one of the things I neglected to tell you is that when these villages here start, um, they actually peter out. And we have this fluorescence of villages and then there's about 100 years where we don't see any villages on the landscape and then it seems to really take off. And once things start taking off, you then start getting Chaco Canyon where there seems to be some differentiation of people in those, those communities. Oftentimes, these, the, the smaller villages as they're starting, uh, especially down here, you start to see some people living in bigger houses. And so that could mean that there's some haves and have nots, but uh, it also may be that those are the people that have por important responsibilities. I, we can ask Jonathan or other people here. I'm not sure we can say that those roles are then inherited by people. It may be something that's that's earned. People's responsibilities are earned. So, I think we, I've we, heard people talk more about um, like sort of maybe some like um, job related differences between right, people right. in houses. Like, you know, you, you might be the person in charge of health and you might be the person in charge of um, farming or something like that. But I haven't heard it sort of in, in these super early, like kind of right at the clicking point of turning to villages. I, I, I haven't heard much about 
um, like kind of locking in a leadership um, right. position that that's that's structured um, in, in as Lisa said in a, an inheritable way right but you're absolutely right that when we start to see that change to um, more complex types of social organization it, it often starts at the village level where you start to see people that um, can inherit their status and have more than other people but we're not at this earliest time period. We're not. We're not seeing that, and it's 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 a huge debate among southwestern archaeologists on whether we get to that point, um, because we know from ethnographic examples like like Hopi, there's a lot of leveling mechanisms that happen within a village to keep everybody in their place. If if people have ever been to a Hopi dance, and they've seen the clowns, the clowns really work to keep people in their place and literally not get too big for their britches. And I have seen people who have tried to be too big for their britches and they've s literally stripped them off of them. <laughs> so, yeah, and actually I think I've seen a clown in the Rio Grande take someone's fur coat off of her for being too big for her britches. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Other questions? That was an excellent question, thank you. This is easy. <laughs> You mentioned different activities with different relationships from the closed big kiva uh, type of structure and then the open plaza. So can you talk a little bit about what those different relationships or activities would be? Oh boy, I wish I could answer that question. Um, so, you know, this is the, the problem with archaeology is, is we have all these wonderful questions to ask and would that I could go back in time and actually see the interactions that were happening here. Um, but what we've got, as my daughter likes, used to like to say when people would say, oh, your parents are archaeologists, how exciting. She'd say, yeah, they dig old people's trash and they're broken down buildings. And so this is what we have. Um, and. I, I, what, what has been left to us in these two areas is often depictions on the pottery or the rock art. And that's where we see lines of dancers, especially down here. They often have fancy hats on and things like that. And up here, uh, we are seeing depictions in bowls of, uh, from this time period, right at the transition of villages, where people are holding hands. And on the northern southwest, the other thing we get is women with um, the butterfly wool headdresses. I don't know if you've seen them uh, in um, ceremonies. Uh, Hopi girls are often wearing those. It's kind of like the Princess Leia kind of head, headdress, a little bit different. Um, but um, what we are seeing is, is some depictions of social roles and social interactions, but we don't know what they are. And uh, um, when you excavate these structures, um, so they may be the ancestors of um, great kivas, but they're not really great kivas at this time. Like they don't know, you know, when they're living in 600 AD building the structure, they don't know that Chaco Canyon's gonna happen. Um, and so the, these communal spaces are there, but they don't look, um, they're, n they're not um, super labor intensive. They're, they're, they're deep and they're centralized in the community. But um, you look at their, um, you know, their floors, there's nothing special. There's no special like altar space. There's no special entrance to them necessarily. Um, the, they look like kind of supersized um, um, domestic houses. So instead of having a hearth that's this big, they might have a hearth that's this big. So it's really hard to tell what the, that there's a, um, a very different activity happening in that space than that's happening in the, in the um, pit house um, spaces. So you, you don't get a good sense of, of ceremonial function. You get a sense of community function, but you don't get a sense of ritual particularly. And, and I haven't found any um, particularly special objects, um, you know, caches or um, in, in these structures or, or read of them in this time period. That happens a little bit later, as far as I know. Um, the exciting time about this, the exciting thing about this time period is it's, it's like the groups are figuring out the rules. They're figuring out how they can live in these larger groups of people and, and how do you have a fight with your neighbor but still stay together because you've got to participate in a, a group event. And, and, and so this is also in the northern southwest why we see this kind of rise in villages. Some people have suggested it might be related to some conflict and violence that's happening. We don't know if it's from outside or inside the communities. Um, and then it, it, whatever happens is people go off and live in their own little groups of related people. And then 
about 100 years later, they come back together to start living in these villages. But they're, the, you know, they're making up the rules. They're just figuring out how do you live in large groups of people and, and how do you interact with each other. So I'm sorry that's a non-answer to a question. All we can do is say this is enclosed space and this, <laughs> is, this is whatever was happening in those was sort of open space to bring people together and maybe large groups of people coming together. Okay, our next question's over here. We have some pottery shards that say Gila Omolovi. What, oh. what can you tell us about those? <laughs> Rich Lang, where are you? <laughs> what did they say on them? They say Hamalvi on them? Yeah. Did, are they written on it? Yeah. Uh huh, and they were probably collected from Hamalvi? So, you know, uh, <laughs> talk to Rich Lang over here. Do you know what color they are? <laughs> Mostly like gray, gray and darker, kind of gray. Uh huh. Are there any orange or yellow ones? No. Yeah. No. Hmm. Well, um, I think you could talk to Rich and bring him into the Arizona State Museum and he could probably see them. Um, Hamalvi <laughs> is a state park um, and it was created as a state park because the sites were being badly looted in the 1980s. And so this is probably people that were out there picking things up um, and glued them on a board so they could remember where they were from. So I don't know where the Gila comes from, but Homolvi? No, uh, it's a river. Yeah, well, there is the Gila River Indian. <laughs> so I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But I think Rich Lang can help you out. We have a question <laughs> here. And then there was another one over here. You were talking about the people figuring out how to live together socially. You also mentioned corn coming, I think, from elsewhere, a different kind of corn. And I'm wondering. And that led to population increases that required different kinds of social structure. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if, similar to the corn, political structure mm -hmm. could have been come from other places and not mm -hmm. developed in situ so much mm -hmm. as insights came to how to handle larger populations of people from contacts with people who potentially they were getting the, the corn that allowed larger populations to grow from? I think that's an excellent question. <laughs> um, I'm really going to step out of my boundaries here and say this type of, of courtyard organization is something that we also see in, in further south in Mexico. Hohokam archaeologists, you can start screaming at me if you want. Uh, <laughs> um, so I don't know if they're being influenced. We know there's exchange with groups to the south. and so. Um, probably not coming in and imposing an organization, but maybe that interaction might give people ideas about how to organize themselves. That's but, really debated. Go ahead. But I guess one thing I think is like, like um, we said that we see a lot of parts of, you know, before the village, we see a lot of the, the same themes resonating for hundreds of years before the village clicks in. So a lot of this stuff does exist locally, um, but it just doesn't all come together as a complete package until um, sometime after 700. So it may be that, there, that it doesn't have to come from outside um, the region, that um, it's just... Um, I don't know what the word is, kind of coalescing um, and becoming a um, solution they didn't know they needed <laughs> until they had the, um, you know, population density to create the problem or they didn't, you know, um, they, so, so I, I, I'm not sure that it comes from outside. I, th I think a lot of this stuff exists. It just um, sort of takes on a new meaning um, when, when the um, contextual situation changes with the population rises and the density of people and the, the social stuff changes. The interesting thing about the northern southwest is the groups that are in the areas surrounding there maintain a fairly mobile, um, although farming, but a lot of hunting and gathering sort of in Utah and, and more further north in Colorado. Um, so in terms of interactions with other groups, it might be the interactions with hunter-gatherers and mm -hmm. that's not going to take you to that, that village level of organization. Something's different ha is potentially happening if you're interacting with groups to the south in, in Mexico. Um, but it's an excellent question. The other thing that we haven't talked about is, you know, Sarah talked about demography, and with all these things, there's sort of a stress, but there's also opportunity. And, and 
you know, human behavior is so complicated and we can't, it's probably not any one of those things, but we, we're, we're still working out what's kind of driving these changes. And it's not only us in the Southwest, the same debates are happening in the Middle East and in China where, where people are making, at different times, making these same transitions to being organized in what we all would say, oh yeah, that's a village. But getting there and understanding how you get to that point is, is what makes archeology span so exciting. <laughs> what would be three or four of the most common features that can be observed in the archeological record that would lead you to say, I think I've got a village here if you find them? You wanna take that one? <laughs> I wanna think for a second. Okay. <laughs> Um, I would say many houses. Mm -hmm. So you've got lots of people living together, and it's beyond those people that you're just related to. And I think the diversity of houses, like like many different kinds of space, um, that, that suggests that that um, that um, that suggests that integration, so that no one place does everything. I would also say that you need some sort of shared space, whether it be a plaza or you build a pe special structure. Um, you also need uh, to have an economy that allows you to stay in that place most of the time. Um, and if you think about it and you're having ceremonies, and especially in the whole calm area, you know, people are talking about ceremonies that might involve feasting. So you have to have an economy that allows you to get some sort of surplus so you can have a big party every once in a while and invite people in and, and share food together and, you know, do what, what happens in small communities um, where you're you're usually sharing things and together. And I guess one thing we haven't talked about is is having um, you know burial grounds and cemeteries where you start linking the place um, through time. So you start having your ancestors there and you there. And um, so I think I think having a, a dedicated um, spot or um, it within the village for for your ancestors is is part of what I would see as as part of a village as well. So that's sort of the archaeological signature, but what we're trying to get at is really that sense of belonging. People, people feel like they belong in that space, and having houses that are organized in little clusters, having a shared space, being in a place where you can call on your neighbor because you've got a huge harvest this year and you need help getting in your corn, I think that's a really important part of thinking of uh, villages and how they're organized, the positive side of things and then the negative side of things of everybody knows what everybody else's <laughs> business in is and then the sort of structure to keep you glued together. And that's hard for us to see archeologically, but interesting questions to, to ask. And I just wanna point out that I just recently did a project with Hopi looking at some plant remains in the museum at the University of Michigan. And I looked at them and I said, how do you want us to organize these teams of students that I'm gonna be having working on these collections. And I was thinking, okay, there'll be the blue corn group and there'll be the red corn group and things like that. And they were like, no, 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 no. You need to organize it by the mesa where these came from and then by the village. And that's how critical at Hopi today village is. It's, it's part of your identity. As my Hopi friend Susan Sakakaku says, it's where you came from and it's where you'll be buried when you die. So. You've talked about the organic process of developing a village, but what about external pressures? Are you able to relate what you're seeing to uh, geo to warfare or mm -hmm. to you know competitive process, and how people might have reacted to gather together to form a village as a result of that? It's an excellent question, and I would definitely say. The archaeologists that work in the Four Corners area, they do write us this transition to living in villages and more people wanting to live together. Um, they do see evidence in the archaeological record of violent deaths and some of the smaller communities where large purport, some of the smaller sites, there's a large proportion of those people that got wiped out. Um, and that's all I can tell you, I don't work in that area, but it does seem like there is tension that might be causing people to come together and live in a group. It's like a school of fish, you know. You can, you can defend yourself because there's lots of you. Not even defend yourself, you might not even need to do it. There's just a big bunch of you. Um, and so definitely in the northern <laughs> southwest, I haven't heard those same arguments for the southern southwest. I don't think so. So yeah. something different is happening down here.
Um, the other thing that's interesting is the sites up in the northern southwest, um, they're uh, or occupied short term. So you'll see a site and it's used for 30 years, 75 years, and then people might pick up and go someplace else. That's not what happens down here. People are living in the same place for a long period of time and making that um, a, a, attachment to that space in a very different way than what's happening in the, the um, Colorado Plateau. The, when you looked at, worked at Wide Ruin, didn't you see a, you know? <laughs> yeah, they kept on shift, shifting within a, a high density population place. You could just sort of trace the sort of movement around um, the, the region. But, but uh, you know, the houses lived here for 30 years and then they lived there for 30 years and then they lived there. <laughs> so there's the same valley, but they're moving around in that, that yeah. valley. Which, which, is, is, which is part of what makes it hard to count them. <laughs> Right. Um, it'd be much easier if they stayed still, so. <laughs> right. which I think but, is what every census taker has ever said. But you know, if you also think about it and you think of Pueblo oral traditions, that migration and that movement on the landscape is part of their mm -hmm. traditional life view. So it's the idea that you are moving, even though there are certain places like Hopi, the center More of their central. universe where people are living for long periods of time. But that's as we get later on than, than what we're talking about here. People, especially in the Northern and Southwest, are moving a lot. Okay, our next question is here. Lisa, you slid something through a minute ago that I'm wondering about. <clears throat> when you've got the smaller village, it's sm smaller than a village area, it's often expected that there are family groups mm -hmm. extended of some sort. Mm -hmm. This is almost like when you reach the village size, you're beginning to trust people who are not part of your family group to be um, instrumental in your survival. Yeah. And yep. I wonder also whether, in, you know, archaeologically, you know, problems with, with proving. Um, when you have that, I might not mind my, lo my, my family coming in and seeing my house, the good points, the bad points, <laughs> mm -hmm. that I might be much more happy with a, an extended group, you know, going to a community center and having any sort of a function there because while I trust you to harvest corn and that I'm going to trade with you my, my pinto beans or whatever. Um, I'm not sure that I want you to, to come into my house. Mm -hmm. And you could almost trace an awful lot of this to an expansion of what you see as your family group mm -hmm. um, and taking mm -hmm. it the step mm -hmm. from a genetic family group to a physical family group of your village of where where you're living and you have to trust these people because they're you know while your survival is dependent on them so is their survival dependent on you yeah i think that's an excellent point and we don't know the mechanism that's keeping people together but they're deciding that it, it's good to live with people that you're not directly related to. And then this is where Sarah and I, most of the sites we work on, it's like five houses where people are living together. So it probably is that some way of defining the immediate family. But uh, in, this is a time period where early on, you know, Julian Stewart talks about this time period as the beginning of changes in kinship relationships where you're starting to get uh, broader groups of people living together and, and maybe groups that have specialized responsibilities. So you're responsible for the winter ceremony, somebody else is responsible for the summer ceremony, something like that. But there, yeah, there is some sort of mechanism where well, you're right, it's a good way of putting it that you trust those other people that you're living with. And even when you're having a fight with them, you're going to say, you know, it's important that you're still a piece of the entire pie. Although, and you know, it's kind of interesting, too. Like, I mean, as, as you say this thing about you're trusting the people, um, in, um, in that earlier time period, you have these shared um, storage spaces. Right. Um, when I've excavated the slightly later houses, I'm seeing a lot of this more storage inside the house, and so it's not, I'm not necessarily trusting everybody with my corn or, um, well, or there's, some, there's some changes. Yeah, you're in a group that you don't care if you open up your storage pit and everybody sees what's in there because yeah. they're all related to you and you expect them to ask for stuff, whereas we, we, when we have this transition to villages, we're also getting this private privatization of stored food yep. and and so it also suggests that the sharing rules start to change and maybe the sharing happens when you all come together for a ceremony but you can't 
you can't go over and ask somebody for a cup of sugar. It wouldn't be a cup of sugar. It would be a cup of cornmeal. A cup but, of rabbit. <laughs> <laughs> or, or something else. To, um, you know, you, there's, there's sort of rules about how you can, can, who you can do that with. So, great question, Barb. Thanks. How, how old were people, how long were people living at this point? How old did they get? Oh, that's a great question. Until they died. They lived until they died. <laughs> um, I think I would not be alive anymore. I think, <laughs> I think I'd be a respected elder. I think so, too. Yeah. I think so, too. So probably 40s, 50s. But, you know, the, the thing about this time period is we don't have great burial populations. Um, I think I've had some folks into their 50s um, in the burial populations, maybe not much older than that, but I don't think there's quite enough to do like the sort of, you know, big population curves and say like people average out to be 35 years old. I don't think you can do that kind of averaging yet, but you can certainly get up into your, your 50s easily. You can have some pretty bad teeth by the time you die. So. <laughs> and so people would have also been old enough to be grandparents, too, to be able to see that, yeah. that uh, uh, their grandkids and pass on those traditions of, yeah, this is the story about when we came to live in this place, that sort of thing. Yeah, um, it seems like um, the uh, kind of a, a spiritual realm would come into existence would be part of the reason to become a village like have you noticed that kivas start getting formed or that sort of uh, uh, of a social situation happening so uh, we start to see these community structures and what we start to see in the pottery is those depictions of of people as in dances and so I, I there's there's something going on that's that's some sort of um, community ceremony and and people have specific ways of dressing for that but how that relates to the belief system oh, I wish we could know <laughs> yeah I mean there's definitely a transition at this time I mean it definitely goes away from a um, sort of you know shaman's view of the world right. um, and I'm not quite sure when you when when that clicks over but you know by what I don't know 800 or 900 you're certainly into a, a, a farmer's view of the world and a um, you know, concern about clouds and rain and, you know, gro new growth and things like that. So right. th there's definitely that spiritual change happens in this um, time period. And you can, like, I mean, I think I've seen it close to my sites in terms of the rock art where there's um, some, some very, you know, strong hunting imagery um, on the early side of that 200 period. And then by 900, I'm seeing little sprouts of corn in the rock art. But, right. um, right. yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure how. how um, but like, how how to say that's a driving factor or a, uh, a not? It's definitely part of um, of the changes that are happening as you're as you're changing your relationship to the land and as you're not moving around as much. And and um, it, so it's part of that that changing relationship to the landscape that that it happens with villages. Um, and if you think about it, when you you when everybody has to be involved in getting ready for a ceremony. Uh, people have rules about what they can bring and there's shared expectations and that's what can bring a big group of people together and provide those rules so people's not people aren't fighting with each other it's it's there's the expectation of people are helping out to, to bring things together in a ceremonial uh, group event context but Excellent question and again I wish we could figure out a way to answer it so one of the things that we wanted you all to think about is that these things are coming together as a package and there's there's little things that we can see sort of sparks of um, prior but but something happens especially in the northern southwest around uh, between 700 and 900 where it, it comes together and villages start being the norm instead of the exception on the the landscape but it's not it's not a linear process either it, it People try it out and then they go back to living in their little farming communities and, or, and just little groups of people and then then it's like, okay, we'll start doing this again and living in these larger I've told Lisa groups. that I think of this period as the village cha-cha. <laughs> it's like you take one step forward, two steps back, one step forward. Because um, you think you, you know, you think you see a progression and then the next century it's um, something completely different happens. Um, so, um, yeah. <laughs> and the, the world's earliest villages are in the Middle East, and they're seeing exactly the same thing. There are time periods where it looks like, wow, they're living in villages, and then bam, everybody else is going off to their small communities. And for there, it's a much longer period of time, thousands of years, and then, then 
everything sort of comes together and it's villages become the norm then. I'm still wondering about the question of critical mass. Mm. Isn't there a number? <laughs> I don't know, 500 to 900. You talked about 14,000 outside Chicago, which is hard for me to think about as a village. Yeah, I know. I, I mean, know. Various, various people definitely do the numbers thing. I mean, and I think yeah. like more Hoakam archaeologists do that, I think, than Northern Arizona archaeologists. And so you'll see in the reports, like, if it's 50 to 100 people, you call this thing a hamlet. If it's over 100 people, you call this thing a village. Um, I think I saw in a report as I was cramming today, you know, 300 people equals a village in the Mesa Verde area at 800 or something like that. But um, I guess, I guess it, it's easier for us to talk about the, um, the um, complementarities and the, the sort of functional aspects of villages than to, to put the numbers on, um, in part because there's a lot of uncertainties to those numbers, as we've said. Um, yeah. um, uh, it, it sort of feels like a, a little bit of fictional math to put that kind of right. number on yeah, the site I can, and have I any can certainty. see that, but I had understood that at, at about <laughs> 500 people, a chief emerges somehow. Oh. It and so is there a governing? Hmm. Does village depend on having a, an, a so-called elite mm -hmm. that runs the religious... No, I think there's, I mean, there's certainly various levels of villages uh, and, you know, th their own progression. So right now we're talking about the sort of incipient village. Um, you know, I think, I think there's a whole scale then that, that progresses from there. So yes, leadership can happen. And I don't know what, what number you put, you put that on. Um, and there's various mechanisms for that leadership to um, emerge, um, you know, whether it's through, um, you know, ritual or war or um, pure organizational factors or something like that. So that's kind of a, a next. Um, progression, um, but but I haven't heard it necessarily associated with a number in quite that way. Um, <laughs> although although people have definitely tried to quantify every bit of this. Um, <laughs> I, and I think you know, with 500 people, it depends on how you're organized too. Um, in terms of, do you have bigger groups that that organize your households together into larger groups? And it it kind of depends on how many groups you have to organize. There is a magic number. It's six, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. That we all talk <laughs> about. Um, um, when you get, and, and I've seen this happen with my students, in fact, I've played around with them every once in a while, that I'll put them in groups of four, and they work together really well, but if you put them in groups of five to six, somebody has to start taking a leadership role. And um, uh, so, but within uh, village level societies, you might have groups of households in a courtyard group, and that's one level, but then you might have four courtyard groups that work together, and that's another level, and so you don't really need a hierarchy, a leadership forming, as long as you've got groups of people that are in, can work together in those groups, and then there's an organization of those groups. So it's it's complicated, but we, we do have this magic number six that <laughs> when, <laughs> when we see, and, and, and you know, the other thing is, when we're talking about these, we're, we're trying to talk about contemporary households, and it's really hard for us to see that archeologically. Um, in the Mesa Verde area, I've heard villages talked about anywhere from 15 to 30 contemporaneous households. So that's a pretty big site. And they can do it up there because those sites are so, the, it, it, many of them are only occupied for 75 years and then they're burned and they have tree rings up there so they can see the contemporary contemporaneous households a little bit easier. And, and when she's saying like 30 households, that's probably what, like 100 to 150 people or something like that, that would be the population size. It's still fairly small. Yeah. Yeah, now I, the suburbs of Chicago, I think they just like the word village. It sounds homey. And right. <laughs> you spoke of the uh, changes in the villages kind of one step forward and two steps back. And would weather changes have had anyth anything to do with that? And is there a way to know that? Mm -hmm. Well, I, 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 yes, I, I think so. Um, and, but I'm not quite sure how to make that relationship very um, very clear. But in this time period between what, like t 290, I think is what the pollen record says in 700. So this is again, August of 290. No, <laughs> just two, so somewhere around 300 and 700. Um, 
the, the, um, some of the climatic reconstructions so show that there's a, just a ton of variability in this time period. Um, and it becomes a lot more stable after 700, and it's a lot more stable sometime before that 300 period. Maybe it's actually a little bit earlier. And so somehow that, that lack of ability to kind of predict or count on um, your farming criteria um, <laughs> may, may be part of the story as to why things don't really latch in um, until after 700. Um, it might be that, that, um, that you can finally sort of count on certain field areas or water supplies or something like that changes. So um, that's sort of a, a broad answer. <laughs> um, I, you know, up in the northern southwest, we have a lovely tree ring record. Um, but uh, seeing how that tree ring record of droughts relates to, to what's emerging here, I, I think thinking about variation and how hard it is to be a farmer in that dry environment up there and how do you deal with that variation is a really interesting question, but I don't think we're going to find a, a, a great correlation. No, it's more of a backdrop thing that you kind of yep. keep in mind. Yep. Like you kind of understand that, that you're living in an unpredictable landscape. And so you keep that in mind as you look at how people solve their storage problems and um, things like that without knowing specifically that that, that, that that was the reason for it. So. One of the things that sort of starts also happening is that, you know, you've got rooms now, so there's increase in storage space rather than those, those big bell-shaped storage pits, and that's one way to kind of start evening out your variation, but then you have to think about store, uh, uh, sharing, you have to think about keeping the pests away, and, and, and so um, we may be seeing sort of cultural ways of dealing with, with the, the variation that's going on that, that may also have implications of, you know, staying in one space because if you've got two years of corn instead of just one year of corn stored, you, you, you want to stay in that space and, and keep your corn safe. So. Okay. Lisa, Sarah, thank you so much. Thank you all. Thanks.